Hello everybody and welcome back to the F2 show. I'm your host Fraser Ford and joining me to reflect on all of the talking points from the final weekend of the season. We have Inside F2 writers Lawrence Griffin and Aaron Harper and we also have F1 Feeder Series podcast host Jim Kimberley. Coming up on the show then... The Formula 2 season came to a close with a Yumu Awasa winning the feature race. We reflect on an exciting weekend of action. The big talking point coming into the weekend was Logan Sargent, but he did secure the super license points that he needs to progress to Formula 1. We discuss a nervy weekend for the American. And finally, we crowned our team's champions this weekend. We discuss MP Motorsport's successful season. But before we go into all of that then, Formula 2 in 2022 has come to an end, Lawrence. And uh, yeah, what what are we going to do with ourselves for three months? I hate this part of the season. I don't know. I'm, I'm really going to miss it because Formula 2 seems to reliably deliver. It's not, it's not like Formula 1 in that sense that you have some good races, some less good races. And, you know, even this weekend, we saw a, a last lap battle for the, for the win in the feature race. So... That sort of entertainment every few weeks or every few months at certain points is going to be one that I'll I'll really miss. Um, but I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to watch the highlights and, and amuse myself that way over the winter. Yeah, we'll be re-watching races, won't we? Uh, Aaron, obviously an interesting season. Lots going on on track and off track as well. Are you uh, sad to see it come to an end? Yeah, it's always, it's always disappointing to see uh, a season come to the close. But then that just whets the appetite for next year, doesn't it? We want to get to Bahrain for testing and then for the first race and Formula 2 and Formula 3 go to Australia for the first time next year. So that'll be really, really good to look forward to. Not looking forward to the alarm clocks on that weekend because we'll probably be all up all night. But, you know, all the same, we still love it. Yeah, don't remind us of that. We're uh, yeah, still uh, <laughs> still recovering from 2022. Jim, uh, should we just forget that there's not going to be any racing for three months? Is it uh, easy, the easiest way to cope, just to pretend it's not happening, I, right? I'm very surprised by you guys, because it feels like there's been no racing already. It feels like we've already had an off-season with how long it's been. When they had the pictures from uh, they were doing on Thursday, I think it was, about here's our Monza winners. I was like, huh? Monza was ages ago. And then <laughs> I realised, oh, that was the last race. But that's... That's how the season goes. It's Abu Dhabi for now is a bit of a a weird one. I feel like when the championship's on the line, it's really something to pump up for. This one, I was just like, this is a really good support race for Formula One. But this whole championship's been a bit weird with all the early championships wrapped up Formula Two and then Formula One. And just a point as well for any American listeners, just echoing the statement from Aaron there about how bad it is in Australia. You have my sympathy because I was... Uh, having to watch on catch up without checking my phone to avoid spoilers this morning because I think the race was on at about one or two thirty or something. It's just woeful hours in America for feeder series fans. So well done anybody who watches this side of the pond. Absolutely. Shout out to all of you guys and your commitment. Uh, let's start by reflecting on the race weekend itself then. The feature race, Ayumu Awasa was our feature race winner, obviously. His second feature race victory of the season. And he seemed to to manage the race really well, Lawrence, didn't he? Yeah, he absolutely did. Um, the The tyres were always going to be an issue on this track with the amount of degradation we get. But he, he spoke in the post-race press conference about how well he managed the tyres and that he was just focused on getting to the end. And that actually he wasn't too worried about having Felipe Drogovic, the, the Formula 2 champion, breathing down his neck because he knew that he'd been conserving his tyres lap after lap. And what a brilliant defence he, he put on towards the end. And I think that really shows his quality, which he's shown on, on a few occasions this year, particularly in France when he had that amazing feature race win. Um, but now I think he'll hope to carry that momentum through the winter and hopefully prove that he can maybe go on and, and challenge for the title next year. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about that in a sec. But Aaron, obviously, Lawrence has just mentioned the, the, the battle that he had with Felipe Dragovic, especially on the last lap, got very close there. There was uh, a moment uh, where Awasa probably did force him off the track. Was it was that hard but fair racing? Yeah, it's the very limit of hard but fair because it was one sort of continuous movement through the arc of the corner. And obviously the tyres are, you know, crying enough by that point. So the fact that he's run wide is kind of understandable. And Drogovic is doing everything he can to keep the pressure on, see if he can force a mistake. And 
you know, just get around the outside in general. But we saw last year in Abu Dhabi how difficult it is on, you know, well, we saw it this year on, on any tyres, how difficult it is to go around the outside at the new Turn 9. So, you know, credit to both of them for driving pretty well with tyres in that condition, the the stress of the situation, and just putting on a great show. It was absolutely brilliant to watch. I had my heart absolutely racing. And, you know, that was about the most excited I was in terms of racing action today because the F1 didn't quite live up to expectations. So, you know, credit to both of them. It was hard. It was fair. There was no sort of antagonistic driving. So all good in my books. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Jim, I suppose moving on, obviously Logan Sargent isn't going to be returning next year. He's uh, gone, going, going to go to Formula One, which we'll talk about shortly. But with that, Ayumu Awasa will be the highest returning rookie next season if he stays in Formula Two like we're expecting to. Lawrence has just touched on it, but is he a title contender next season? It'll depend on the team, but I imagine he'll have a, a decent shot wherever he goes because he's really pro, really proved this year he kind of came out of nowhere. He feels a little bit almost like his, his compatriot Sonoda, that it's, who's this guy? I remember saying that at the start of last season um, when he came into F3, and I was like, oh, what? And then this year, a bit surprised to get the graduation. And he's really, really stormed it, and he's beaten the likes of Darvala, Vips, Armstrong, you know, classic names in Formula 2 at this point, and has really shown his quality two feature race wins is a really good reward for it and then we've seen him go toe to toe with the best that formula two has to offer this year with that final final lap that sort of thing to end your season on will really put you on a high for the start of next year so i imagine as we imagined at the start of this year we've got about 10 drivers who are championship hopefuls at the start of the year but awas is firmly one of those he's really really impressed me this year and a definite star, probably the star at the moment. And no offence to uh, Liam Lawson, who's just finished the top of the Red Bull drivers. But I think he is a star of the Red Bull junior team right now, which has desperately been crying out for having a star. Yeah, great end to the season for him. Looking forward to seeing what he can do next season then. Okay, Jack Doohan obviously put a mega stint in on the medium tyres uh, on the alternate strategy to try to make that work. But it was all undone when he came out the pits with a loose wheel. First of all, I'm glad that everyone was okay because I was slightly worried when that wheel came back across the, the track and drivers, you know, driving towards it. Uh, I was, yeah, definitely worried at that point and glad the marshals are okay. Go on, Jim. Yeah. I have I have to say that I woke up early. I was about six o'clock and that was the thing that actually made me wake up properly this morning because when I was watching it, that was a heart in mouth moment. As soon as I saw the wheel come off, I was like, oh my God, uh, something you never want to see. And it really, when you saw the wheel hit the barrier and how much damage it did to the barrier, you're thinking, what could that do to a car? So, so lucky. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it really sinks in, doesn't it? When it's you see how much damage that did do to the barrier, how what it could do to a car. So, yeah, glad everyone's okay. Glad the marshals are okay. But obviously, that really yeah, ruined his race, didn't it, Lawrence? I mean, what, what could he have done if, uh, yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but uh, what could he have done uh, had he had four wheels on his wagon, so to speak? Well, he was just on the pit exit when his tyre decided to, to roam free. And he was coming out just in front of Dennis Hauger. And he was about six seconds off the race lead with eight laps left and brand new soft tyres. And so I think, is it realistic for him to be a second lap faster than the, the medium runners at that stage of the race? Probably, once they're managing tyres that heavily towards the end of the race. I think he could have still challenged for the win. I think it would have been a definite podium for him. Because he had really strong pace out there, even on the harder tyres. And he was actually matching Ayumu Asa's times pretty closely throughout the race. It was such a shame because he was having such a lonely race out there, all on his own. He had a huge gap behind him. He had no one in front. He only has his engineer telling him what the gap is. And he just has to trust that the strategy is going to work, that what they're telling, them, telling him is right. And he's waited that whole race to pit. He comes out of the pits with fresh tyres, low fuel, ready to make the overtakes and get into the thick of it and move up the order. And then that's suddenly taken away from him. And then that's the season over. And that it was such a shame for him. And I think that sort of sums up his season because he's shown such good pace. 
but the points hole that he's got, the results that he's had, just haven't reflected the talent that he he has. Um, so I think it'll be a case of going back and having some time off over the winter, and then coming back fresh next season, hopefully, and have a have a proper title challenge. Because we talk about Imuasa being the rising star in the Red Bull Junior Academy, he at one point was in the conversation for the Alpine seats. So if he can perform well next season, he's got a decent chance of getting a drive in 2024. You, you've summed up exactly. In my, on my notes right in front of me, I said it's literally sums up his season. His one lap pace has been brilliant. His race pace in the second half of the season has, has been uh, mega as well. But he, he's just been caught up in so many incidents, hasn't he? And has so many reliability issues all season long. So absolutely with you on that, Lawrence. He, he probably would have been, Aaron, hoping to, to come into, well, at the beginning of the season, you know, hoping to uh, beat Logan Sargent, for example, uh, at, you know, being highest placed rookie. He ends it P6 in the standings behind Awasa, who we've just been speaking about. Will, it, will he be disappointed at this season or will he be happy knowing that um, not necessarily, you know, that, that isn't necessarily down to him purely as a driver. I think the important thing will be that the performances when they've been good have been excellent. So he took that feature race win in Spa. He drove brilliantly at Silverstone, I believe it was, where he turned the, the wet tyres into slicks and just drove off into the distance. His qualifying pace has been excellent. You know, in, in another year, things go kind of a bit more his way. You know, all the wheels stay on the car today and he comes through and maybe takes at least a podium, maybe even the victory. But he's definitely showing that he is a potential Formula One driver for the future. We don't know where he's going to end up next season and it can be a little bit up and down when you move teams. We've seen, we've seen that with Felipe Drogovic. So if he can string another really solid F2 season together, maybe Alpine will be able to find him a seat in F1 for 24 maybe 25. I mean, they might need to find a, a, a second engine supplier to do that. Um, but there, there's definitely optimism around Jack Doohan and you know, Australian Grand Prix racing is looking in pretty good hands with Oscar Piastri and perhaps Jack Doohan joining the scene as well. Not bad at all, right, Jim? I mean, uh, I, I, for me, for me, I, I, uh, I think he's had as good a season as Logan Sargent, if not maybe... Yeah, there or thereabouts, maybe a little bit better than Logan Sargent. His overall, you know, one lap qualifying pace and, uh, yeah, as a driver, how highly do you rate Jack Doohan? I don't know if I agree that I'd put him above Sargent, but I think they're definitely uh, equal. I think Logan's has some woes, well, self-inflicted, certainly, like we're looking at Zandvoort, but also woes which weren't his. Was it like Castellet when he had the, the pit stop that went wrong as well? He was doing well, so he could have finished... The, the P3, he was already top rookie, but with the three of those, I'm just looking at the, the championship now, Drogovic, Porsche, Lawson, and then Sergeant Nwasa Duan. Those, and then Fittipaldi as well, shout out. Those rookies came through this year to really do well. Um, so I, I don't know if he's better, but I don't think it really matters at this point. What's good for him and what's impressed me the most is he seems to have matured an awful lot throughout the year. I, I just felt he was a bit, driving angry or something always seemed really frustrated in the car and then the race this feature race this weekend seems to have just shown that level of how much he's grown and i don't know if that's the alpine connection or what that the the engineer or trust the engineer was just saying just manage a pace do this do that and he was just like roger okay copy there's no what are you doing i need to know all this sort of stuff he just seemed to be really comfortable in himself and then you see the difference, I suppose the pressure was there, but you see the difference with Sargent, who just seemed to be really frustrated, really panicked. I suppose when you're leading the race, you're not going to be so panicked, but it just showed a lot of mental growth for me for where Doohan's come this year. So excited to see what happens to him next year. I don't I don't know what the plan will be on that Alpine route with regards to getting getting a, a drive in Formula One. And it's one of these frustrating things at the moment. It's like, there's only one team that you can go to and problems with the driver academies uh, yeah i find it frustrating Drogovic doesn't go in to formula one this year because there wasn't a driver academy affiliation and there's no seats so there should be 10 teams that he could possibly go into realistically that maybe four and it's like maybe he could have replaced schumacher but they don't they don't do that because he's not connected to Haas, and that's frustrating so i think of the 
the top 10 in Formula 2 this year, three of them could really have gone and got a promotion and really shown their mettle in Formula 1 next year. And it's frustrating that's not going to happen. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. It is frustrating. Hopefully, Felipe Drago is your final seat. Moving forward, potentially Jack Doohan as well. Uh, Liam Lawson could be put uh, into that category as well. Really strong weekend for him. Dominated the the sprint race. It's the biggest margin of victory in the sprint race all season long, uh, which, uh, yeah, it shows how well he did. Uh, a podium in the feature race as well, Jim. I mean, it was a really strong end to the season for him. And, uh, yeah, catapults, well, catapults, it moves him up to to, free, free, f- to third place in the, uh, in the standards, doesn't it? Get your words out, Fraser. Easy for you to say, mate. Yeah, he did all right. He, um, all right, he did very well actually. When when the commentators were talking about Lawson uh, almost being allowed to pass for sure in the sprint race, he's like, oh, for sure he's going to come back with fresh tires later. <laughs> no, he ain't because Lawson said goodbye to the entire field. It's probably his best weekend of the year. Uh, he's almost sent a bookmark, a bookend. It sorry, should I say? He sent a bookend his championship because he got the the double podium back at the start of the season in Bahrain as well, and that's when we all thought he was a proper championship contender, and he kind of got not necessarily outshone, but outperformed by by his teammate Logan Sargent throughout the year. So I think I think that'll be a bit of a brownie point situation. They'll be happy that he actually beat Logan in the championship standings in the end after kind of trailing him as the season went on. But yeah, in terms of this weekend though, he really was finding something in the car, finding something in, in Gas Marina that really suited him and made the most of it. Uh, what way to, to end your time in Formula 2 because he's not going to come back. I think. And yeah, I it's a good it's a good thing. I just don't know what happens to his career at this point. Like, is he gonna go tin top racing? He's got the Red Bull connection and you've got this kind of reserve development driver role, but does that get you a seat in Formula One? I don't know if there's so many Red Bull junior drivers who are ready to jump in front of him. So I don't know what happens now, but if you're gonna wave goodbye to Formula Two, this is a proper way to send it off. Yeah, it really is. Sounds like it's going to be uh, the reserve role at Alpha Tauri and uh, or Red Bull and um, and a super Formula drive, doesn't it? By the sounds of it. Uh, mm. But you're right. If if Awasa does well next season, if Fittipaldi does well next season, or you know, there's so many names, then uh, you're almost forgotten about, aren't you? You're absolutely spot on. That's his fifth sprint, uh, his fifth sprint race victory, by the way. Still yet to win a feature race. May well never win a feature race. And actually, I was looking at this earlier. Between there's been two Kiwis uh, in the modern era of Formula Two. Obviously, the other one, Marcus Armstrong, he's won four sprint races and never a feature race. So the Kiwis between them, nine sprint race victories and never a feature race, which is uh, incredible. Two. You available for a pub quiz, Fraser? Because that's sort of trivial. Hey, answer. come on, come on. Well, on, <laughs> on that note, right? There's one other nation who have won a sprint race but never have won a feature race. If you know the answer, let us know in the comments. I'll be really impressed if you know the answer. To that one other nation who have won a sprint race but never won a feature race. Any any of you guys know? Do you know the answer? No, not a clue. Not a clue. Not a clue. Not no. Head. Let us know in the comments. Uh, yeah, if you do know the answer, I'd be mm. super, super impressed. Go on, Jim. Are you going to look like you're going to say something? I was going to say something. I realised there's, uh, there's a Lundgaard that was around, it's, so it's not Vesti's sprint race. Or was it? Is it, is it Denmark? It is Denmark. Yeah, you're right. So, yeah, very, very good. Very good. Yeah, so Lundgaard has won a couple of sprint races. Vesti's won a sprint race, but uh, they've never won a feature race. Jim, that is very impressive stuff. Yes. Don't bother leaving comments, guys. I've already seen it. <laughs> good stuff. Um, Felipe Drogovic then. Double podium this weekend means the MP Motorsport win the team's title for the first time at this level in their history they won it by eight points in the end by carter from carlin who finished in second uh is this a turning point for them lawrence can they mix it with the best teams uh again next season and and moving forward that's a difficult one because they have had an amazing season but that's only really been on one side of the garage felipe drogovic has done brilliantly in that seat and seems to have some sort of affinity with the team. They did well with him in 2020, uh, 2020. He picked up a few wins for them, whereas there was only the one win last season for Vashore and one podium compared to five wins and 12 podiums this season. And they've made that step up together, really. I think Drogovic has galvanised that team. And in a spec series, it's all about the relationship with the engineers and how you set up the car and how you get 
those extra tenths of a second out of it. And him and his engineers clearly know how to get that out of the car. And Novelak's a rookie and, and he's still getting used to the series. And so it's perhaps not fair to be too harsh on, on him. But definitely that side of the garage has absolutely got it right. So it'll be really interesting to see if Dennis Hauger, who himself has had a, a, a tricky season after coming up as a Formula 3 champion, if he can make that work in the same way, if they can make this sort of success happen long term. The one thing Dennis Hauger will hope to is to have the same level of reliability as Felipe Drogovic has had. I don't know what they've done to that car, but it's been absolutely bulletproof all season in a way that I'm not I'm not sure if anyone else has had such a good run of reliability this season. He's had two retirements this year, and those were in Monaco, where he pitted onto tyres that were suited to conditions which simply didn't exist, and then decided to to pack it in, which was quite a good decision. And then in Monza, when he had contact, I think it was with Amory Cordiel, the car itself has never actually let him down like it has done with so many others, including his main rival, Teo Porcher. So if they can keep that sort of reliability up and get that good relationship with the engineers, with Dennis Hauger, and maybe have some of that luck on the other side of the garage with Clement Novelak if he stays or with, with someone else if they come in, then maybe they can you know, realistically challenge, but it was such a stark contrast to P2 in the championship with Carlin, where their drivers, I think, are only separated by a couple of points, and it's been a really well-balanced on, on either side of the garage. So they'll hope to sort of look at that next season, I think, and try and get their second car, as it were, a little bit closer to the top car. Yeah, you're right. 87% of their points this season scored by Felipe Dragovic. You, you can't underestimate how important his input has been to their success this season, can you, Jim? It's, well, there's no way to say it. If, if we had Novalak twice, two Novalaks, and Novalak scored 40 points, I think, yeah, when I was just checking. 40, yeah. Um, yeah, so if you had two of those, that's 80 points. You'd finish P9 in the team's chan- championship. So, it says it all, doesn't it? You can have that level of domination and it's going to help you get the title. And Lawrence puts it right as well. That bulletproof car will help too. If the Carlins were both bulletproof, they would have had the team's championship this year. And it's a bit of a lottery in a spec series like this about how that sort of stuff comes out, if your engine's going to survive or not. Um, but yeah, it's... It's entirely all of the success this year, a Drogovic thing. He's he, he's just in a different level compared to what we saw with Virtuosi, uh, where Joe, and I respect Joe, I think he's a good driver as he's proved in Formula 1 this year, but Joe did outshine him. When I mentioned earlier, there was not an outshining. Joe outshined Drogovic last year. I don't... I don't know what's going to happen with MP next year in regards to what level they're going to perform at. Haug is disappointed this year. I know he got P10 in the end, but coming up as the F3 champion and racing in Prima, you've seen with Piastri what can happen in that sort of situation, and it absolutely didn't. So uh, it kind of raises some question marks about Haug uh, in Formula 2. His second season is going to be much better, and it was significantly better in Formula 3, after all, when he became champion. So... Who knows what might happen? Maybe that'll click, but you'd expect with Prima that, that would be the stronger team, but they've just had a, a shock of a season by their standards. So I don't know. It's I don't think they'll be team's champions next year, but I think this will really buoy them and also make them more attractive for any staff that they may be trying to get and poach from other teams, saying, look how good we are now. We took the driver's championship. We took the team's championship. And to be honest, we might be taking Hauger and whoever his teammates money because they could probably charge a bit more to say, look how attractive this proposition is, which may raise their game. And I'm all for that. Yeah, fascinating to see how or well, where they go from here. Isn't it? And I suppose that was going to be my question to you, Aaron. Is and I don't want to spend too much time talking about this because it's something that we'll discuss on the season review podcast, which is coming out in the next few weeks. Subscribe to uh, yeah, to see when that comes out, by the way. Uh, but yeah, MP no Motorsport, they, they've never finished in the top five of the team standings uh, in the modern era of Formula 2. Uh, you know, and then and then they've gone, they've won it this year. Uh, the upwards trajectory is obviously evident. Um, what, what, has, what has inspired that? And, and obviously, what are the, the benefits of that? Obviously, Jim's just said, you can attract more staff, you, you, you can charge more money for the seats. It, 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 it kind of spirals, doesn't it? 
yeah, it's all kind of come together. It's been like a perfect storm in a in a good way for MP Motorsport this year because Lawrence touched on the relationship between Felipe and the team and obviously having a bulletproof car really helps because if your car just keeps going, you're going to get to the end of the race. And if everyone else is dropping out or having an accident, you're going to be there to pick up the spoils. But Drogovic has done a great job. That team's morale has been really high all through the season. Obviously, they got off to a good start and that keeps everyone going. And they had that championship lead, so they, they could sort of think about how they managed the season. They didn't need to panic. There was no air of, oh my gosh, this is getting out of control, we're going to lose it. There was no sort of Ferrari-style implosion to you know reference a Formula One team and how it can all go wrong. They were very calm, and that transpired into Felipe's driving. At no point did he look flustered. And then you saw this weekend, he was able to let loose a bit more, be a bit braver with his overtakes and, you know, just just going to have a bit of fun. And the team has gelled around him beautifully. Obviously, how that then goes into next season, you've got Dennis Hauger coming in and, you know, looking maybe a Mick Schumacher sort of thing where he's a second season sort of guy. And can MP deliver that? Because they've gone through five seasons now of Formula 2, 6th, 8th, 7th, 6th, 6th, 1st. That, that's quite a leap. Either this is an anomaly or it's the beginning of something special. Yeah, it's going to be really fascinating to see, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to next season already. Um, Logan Sargent, we can't go the show without talking about Logan Sargent, can we? The only graduate, it uh, confirms that is going to be moving on to, to Formula One next season. He finished P4 in the standings, which was obviously enough to get him the super license points that he needed to progress into Formula One. But he looked so nervous all weekend, Lawrence, didn't he? There was points where you could hear it on the radio, you could hear it in his interviews, you could tell he was nervous. Yeah, there was a lot of pressure on him this weekend and it did show. Um, it, it was almost as if he went into every braking zone on those opening few laps with thinking, if I make contact here, that's my chances of F1 gone. It's like that was a, a part of his thought process and he wasn't able to sort of compartmentalise it. You could almost read the emotion in terms of the body language of the car, where he was positioning it, how late he was braking. He just wasn't aggressive enough, I think, at the on the opening laps, especially at the start of the sprint race, where he ended up in the middle of a, a sort of four-wide sandwich going into, into turn six. And that's the last place you ever want to be. And maybe if he'd been more aggressive, he wouldn't have been in that in that situation. And holding back will never work. In racing, there's going forwards and there's going backwards and there's no in between. And I'm glad he's made it now because it wasn't it wasn't looking great for him at, at points. He was stuck behind Roy Nassani at one point, of all people. Um, we know how aggressive and sometimes even erratic Roy Nassani can be. You know, he showed that in in Silverstone, um, which, thank goodness, nobody got hurt in that accident. Um, but yeah, he just struggled to... He seemed to struggle to make that decisive move. But then when it did come, it came no, where nowhere we'd expect it. We cut to a shot of him side by side with Nassani at turn 12, I think it was. I thought, how on earth have we ended up here? So he credit to him for making the move in the end. And... You know, I can I can say well, I like I'm not a racing driver. Maybe he put, played it perfectly in terms of holding back a little bit and making absolutely sure he avoided the incidents because he has a whole career ahead of him in Formula One now. Yeah, absolutely. Other than the obvious marketing opportunities he brings, Aaron, uh, what will he offer Williams Formula One team next season? He's going to offer them someone who's hungry to succeed, who's going to really drive that car and really push it and we'll get a really good benchmark of where he is because Alex Albon is now an established Formula One driver of a creditable standard, regular point scorer in you know good enough machinery. He's done minor miracles at times in that Williams this year. Just think back to Australia where he took a set of tyres, 57 laps, and still ended up in the points with a last lap pit stop. So we'll, we'll get a really good barometer of where Logan is in his development. He'll probably get you know half a season's grace in a similar way to Zhou Guan Yu did this year and if he can have a, a a season of the caliber that Joe has had i think that will be enough to to see him through because we're not expecting williams to be challenging for podiums 
or you know anything the the major point scores. So a sensible approach to his racing, keep out of trouble when you know presented with you know those difficult situations, but at the same time take your opportunities if there's a chance to get onto an alternate strategy when it's you know slippery, take the risk, be brave. So we're we're going to learn a lot about Logan and his temperament. I think we learned a lot about him this weekend because. Obviously, it's a stressful situation, pressurized situation. He'll have learned a lot about himself. So it'd be really good to see how he takes this into his opening races as a Williams driver next year. I, th- I think if you're if you're watching this and you don't really know who Logan Sargent is, he shouldn't be underestimated when he goes into Formula One. It was only at the end of 2020 that he very narrowly missed out on the F3 title to none other than Oscar Piastri, who went on to win in, in F2 and has now got a seat in Formula 1 at McLaren next season. So he can he definitely possesses the ability to go out there and and match Alex Albon at the least I think. And even in Formula 2 this season he's he's made that step up. We saw at the beginning of the year everyone expected such brilliant things from the rookies particularly Dennis Hauger coming up as Formula 3 champion and most of them struggled to begin with to get up to speed. Dewan had that first pole position, but then struggled to convert it into points. And it was Logan Sargent that emerged through the middle of the season as the one that was consistently finishing in the points. Um, so I think there's no there's no question that he can make that step up, adapt and and race really well next year. Is he ready for Formula One, Jim, in your book? Yeah, I, I think a bunch of the drivers are probably ready for Formula One. And if you're going to have a driver ready for Formula One, Williams doing the right thing by shoving him in the car as many FP1s or that one FP2 as you possibly can. In some regards, I actually believe the races that we've had some of the best entertainment in Formula One this year have come from the sprint weekends, which I'm not a huge fan of, but but taking that practice session away really does aid. And I did think, why don't they just enforce every session, every weekend, you have to put one of your top drivers, one of your two drivers in Formula One, out of the car to make way for one of these rookies because it prepares them better. And then in terms of the entertainment, you've got half the grid potentially then who don't have as much preparation and it makes it a bit more entertaining. But that's a completely different thing. But to answer your question, I think he's ready. I think he's not really done anything to embarrass himself being in the car. He's always brought the the, the FW44 home to the Williams garage which is a huge thing to do and then we had a, a bit of a moment in qualifying I think it was this time for the F2 race and that was a nerve showing but not to liken Logan Sargent to Lewis Hamilton because I don't think they are that same level but do you remember when Lewis Hamilton was fighting for the first championship way back in Brazil years and years ago the nerves do get to you this is this was Logan's championship he wasn't going to win the championship but he knew if I'm going to realize my dream and then for Lewis Hamilton back then, it was of being world champion, for Logan Sargent of being in Formula One. This is a weekend that I have to make everything go right. And things weren't going right. He wasn't qualifying on pole position. He was in the melee in the middle. So in some regards, the fact he had that pressure, still kept out of the barriers, didn't hit anybody, was nervous. But I mean, I'd argue was it this very pros thing to do of just get the points that you need. And I agree with what you mean, Lawrence, you're forward or backwards. But in this case, he knew solid points will get me a Formula One drive. And I really don't blame him for just saying, you know what? I'm going to give a wide berth to Cordiel behind me and Nassari in front of me and say what you want about those drivers. But even if it was Drogovic and Porsche in front and behind, just keeping the car, keep, you look how close he could have been. Was it Drogovic for that moment where he almost lost the nose, almost lost his front wing when he outbreaked himself? It's just a, a moment like his Formula One dream can go. So... If he was as nervous as it sounded he was, and he still came home with double points, that shows to me he's he's ready for Formula One. I, th- I think he did he did so well in the end because you could you could see it almost going wrong, and you could feel his nerves for for him to still keep his head and actually come through that. We we talk about it in in football a lot in terms of the teams who are going to win titles are teams who manage to get the wins even on days where they're playing really badly and everything seems to go wrong, but they they just get over the line. And that's something that mentally some sports people have and some don't. And I think he actually did show that he has that. And he'll learn from that experience. And maybe if he has a Hamilton-esque moment of it going down to the wire in the championship in Formula One, that then he'll have that experience stored and he'll be mentally stronger as a result of that. 
and it'll be at Abu Dhabi because they've got the contract for however long to host the finale. So he's, a, he's all good. I did want to just say one final point um, with with Mr. Logan Sargent as well because he's he's come through now. He's now got what was it to get that feature race win, one sprint race win as well. So that was a point where he was on the ascendancy and he didn't get. And this is a question I, I kind of feel when we didn't see Ilock get the seat a few years ago. Like this is a now guy who's finishing people in the championship standings. And as Lawrence said, if you don't know who, Lawrence, who Logan Sargent is, like why is a guy P4 getting the, the nod to Formula One? But in a weird alternate reality, that Piastri moment you mentioned, if it wasn't for Zendeli and him colliding in that finale at Mugello in 2020, it could have been Sargent who was the F3 champion. It could have been Sargent in the Prima, the Venning next year and done the Piastri route. So it's fascinating to me to see him now joining Piastri at the same time because I felt that those two are kind of interconnected in some ways and they're going to be joining Formula One at the very same time. And the stuff that he did last year in Formula Three with a car that was well below the standard of the top drivers, and that also shows to me that he's he's probably ready for Formula One. He's one of the top junior talents at the moment. Absolutely. Really looking forward to seeing him in Formula One. Uh, and yeah, I suppose a massive congratulations to Logan Sargent from everyone at Inside F2. Been a pleasure to watch him this season. OK, let's take a look at the final championship standings of the season then. Felipe Drogovic was crowned our champion back in Monza and he signed off with a double podium this weekend, demonstrating the consistency that has taken him to the title. Tail Porsche, he'll be disappointed, finishes over 100 points behind uh, Felipe Drogovic in the end, but he was best of the rest in P2. Liam Lawson jumped above Logan Sargent in the final round of the season by one point, as we've said, but I'm sure Logan Sargent won't mind too much, as as we've said, he is off to Formula One. And feature race winner Ayumu Awasa and the unfortunate Jack Doohan round out the top six. And the team standings? As we've discussed, MP Motorsport are our team champions after an incredible season for the Dutch team. They finish in the top five of the team standards for the first time in the modern era of Formula 2 and they've gone and won it. Carlin jumped up to P2 in the final race of the season. Mechanical issues for the French team that contributed to that strong finish to the season nonetheless for the British team. Disappointing sixth season for Prima, they finished fourth. High Tech recorded their lowest finish and points all since they entered Formula 2 in fifth. And Dams beat Virtuosi to round out the top six. And if you want to reflect on any of those standings, they will be available on our website, www.insidef2.com, as always. Okay, that's all we got time for today, then. My thanks to Lawrence, to Aaron, and for Jim for joining me on today's show. As I mentioned earlier on in the show, our, our season review podcast will be coming your way over the next couple of weeks. So subscribe to your chosen podcast player and keep an eye out for that. We'll also be keeping you up to date with all of the post-season tests, all of the latest news, all of the driver announcements and so much more. So make sure you see our social media channels for that. And finally, thousands of you have been watching and listening to the podcast all season long. We want to hear from you. What have you enjoyed? What do you think could be even better about the podcast? What would you like to see next season? Let us know in the comments. DM us on social media or DM me if you want to. Feel free to slide into the DMs and let us know what you like, what you don't like and what you want to see. Big thank you to the team Inside F2 as well. Behind the scenes, working tirelessly to bring you guys uh, home the content that you read, that you watch and that you listen to. But from me, Fraser Ford and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time. Yeah.